simply a comparison of these two things, like in a t-test, right? This group with this group. So what I need to figure out is what do I need to do to fix my alpha per comparison to make sure that my alpha for the experiment doesn't get bigger? Because this is the problem. This is the problem. Think of it this way. You know, if I um, roll one die, the probability of getting a number is whatever that probability is. But if I roll three dice, then the probability of getting one of those numbers increases. It increases, right? So we have to figure out how to avoid that. Now, we're going to actually go backwards. If I wanted to find out, if I was doing 15 t-tests, what's the probability of making a type 1 error? Let's calculate it so you can see that it's bigger. All right? Now, if I was going to calculate the probability of making a type 1 error for each of those 15 tests, I'd have to calculate the probability of making exactly one type 1 error, and then exactly two, and then exactly three, and then exactly four. And I'd have to do it that way. That's a complicated way of doing it. There's a simpler way. The simpler way is to go backwards and find out what's the probability of making no type 1 errors. All right? So if the probability of making a type 1 error for one test is 0.05, what's the probability of making no type 1 errors for one test? 0.95, right? 0.95. Okay, that's the probability of making no type 1 errors for that one test. Now, if I have 15 tests, the probability of making no type 1 errors is 0.95 raised to the 15th power. You're multiplying them. You're multiplying them. Okay? Now, I just have to tell you, this makes the assumption that each of these tests is independent of each other. That's not really true. It's not strictly true. But it's OK, for, because this is just going to be a ballpark number to show us how big our alpha can get. OK? So 0.95 raised to the 15th power gives me a probability of 0.46. Now, that's not the probability of making a type 1 error. That's the probability of not making a type 1 error. Right? That's 0.95 raised to the 15th. How do I get the probability then of making a type 1 error? Do you see it? Yeah, 1 minus. That's the probability of making a type 1 error if I do all 15 of these t-tests. Write that down and then take a moment and think. Okay? That's the probability of making a type 1 error. Do you understand how crazy large that is? Right? We're only willing to accept a type 1 error rate of 0.05. Here, this is over 50%. If you did all 15 of these t-tests and you got significant results, well, like how could you expect otherwise? But those significant results, that would just be due to chance. They would be errors if you don't make corrections for those tests. That's why if somebody comes to you and says, I just want to do t-tests for this, they're really running into problems because they are likely to get significant results, but those significant results are likely to be type 1 errors. It's a, it's a big issue. Okay. So our whole task in Chapter 13 is going to be to find ways to avoid increasing that alpha per experiment. Usually, by adjusting our alpha per comparison. Now, sometimes we adjust alpha directly, and sometimes it's going to be indirectly, but that's the, whole, that's the whole name of the game in this chapter, is making sure alpha doesn't increase. And there are different ways to play with it to make sure that that's OK. Now, does anybody have questions on that, how that where that came from, by the way? Does that make sense? OK. So look. Right? Here, here's a, um, here's a formula for finding the alpha per, the, per experiment, the alpha experiment-wise. That's exactly what I just did, but I just did it step by step. J is the number of tests, the number of independent tests you're doing. Right? That's what I did. I said, instead of doing it to alpha, I said 1 minus alpha. That gave me the 0.95. I raised it to J because I was 15 t-tests. 
and then I subtracted it from one. That gave me my alpha per experiment. Yeah. So in your example, you just yeah. Like yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about how we make these comparisons. Okay. Comparison. Following an ANOVA, following an ANOVA with a t-test between two of the sample means. But, like I said, it's a little more complicated than that. We make a distinction between a pairwise comparison and a complex comparison. Pairwise is when you're comparing one mean with another mean. Right? One group's mean with another group's mean. That seems obvious. Right? If I, if I follow up my uh, example of five drugs in a placebo, if I follow up with a t-test between any of those two groups, that is a pairwise comparison. Okay, What's a complex comparison? Complex is when you're taking essentially like groups of means and comparing them to each other. Let's say of my five drugs, yeah, let's say, let's say I have a different study, okay? Six drugs, six antidepressants, three are from the family of MAOIs, Right, that's a different, uh, a particular type of inhibitor, and three are from the family of SSRIs, a different type of drug. Right, they come from different families of drugs. Okay, what I might want to do is compare the three MAOI drugs to the three SSRI drugs. Okay, when I would do that, so I'd be comparing the average of the MAOIs to the average of the SSRIs. That's a complex comparison. It's a complex. It's not just one group compared to another group anymore. So we're going to make a distinction between these pairwise and these complex comparisons. First, we're going to be learning only about pairwise comparisons. We'll get to complex comparisons probably Wednesday. OK. Uh, I wouldn't say pairwise is a type of complex. I mean, I guess technically you could say it is. It's like the simplest version of a complex comparison. But it's a little funny to think of it that way. All right, and all right, so here are our complex comparisons. Our alpha per comparison, alpha sub PC. Right, alpha used for each test that follows an ANOVA. So usually we're going to be working on that to, to make sure our alpha for the experiment doesn't get too big. We also make a distinction, and this is these planned comparisons. We make a distinction between comparisons that are planned before we look at our data and comparisons that are planned after we look at the data. Okay? There is a difference, right? Looking when you've already looked at your data, you have extra knowledge about the pattern of results that you didn't have beforehand. That affects the type of comparisons you can make because it's affecting the probabilities because you're already looking at the patterns. So the two types, a priori, a priori means before the fact. And those are comparisons that you decide on before you've even seen the data. Those are usually based in theory. You know, in some kind of theory, you think that the pattern of results are going to come out in a particular way. You think the drug is going to reduce depression or whatever it is that you're looking at. Okay, So those comparisons, you decide on them before you actually look at your data. Comparisons after the fact are called a posteriori or, more commonly, post hoc or post hoc. A posteriori is, is, is true, but I don't usually hear people use that expression. They use the expression post hoc or post hoc. In SPSS, they use that term, post hoc. Okay, It means after the fact. After you've already looked at your numbers, what comparisons are you going to make? So the adjustments are going to be different depending on whether you've looked at your data or whether you haven't looked at your data. Because if you've looked at the data, there's always the risk that you're going to stack the deck in your favor. So you have to be particularly careful. Okay? Okay. So we're going to learn how to do a couple computations, not all of them. But some. Now we're going to start out with the simplest one. The simplest one, actually, I don't know if I would call it the simplest one, but it's the typical one everybody does. 
um, is called Fisher's Protected T-Test. That's following an ANOVA with T-tests, simple T-tests. So how is it different from just doing all these multiple T-tests? Well, it's called protected for a reason. You cannot do Fisher's T-tests unless you have a significant ANOVA. So you have to do an ANOVA first. If it's not significant, you're done. If it is significant, then you can follow up, compare it with doing T-tests, these Fisher's protected T-tests. Okay. Now let's take a look at this for a moment. Um, here are the two formulas for these protected T-tests. These are if your ends are unequal. These are if your ends are equal. Generally, we're going to be using the equal ends formula. From here on in, some of our concepts get complicated, so we wind up using a lot of examples that have equal ends to keep it a little simpler. Okay, so look at this. This is our typical t-test. x bar i minus x bar j, that means the means of the two groups you're interested in. Right, the, group, the means of the two groups you're interested in. Divided by, now, what's down here? Well, in a typical t-test, our denominator would have the standard error of the difference between the means, right? What's incorporated into that standard error? S squared p, the pooled variance. Right, the pooled variance would be in that denominator somewhere. When you get to ANOVA, the substitute for S squared P is MS within. Right? It's a measure of variability within your groups. So MS within takes the place of S squared P. Just like when we did ANOVA, we looked at that. Of course, we have to assume homogeneity of variance in order to do that. But that's generally assumed if you're going to do this. OK, so this is, a, this is typically a Fisher's protected t-test. And you use MS within, and you would use degrees of freedom from within, which actually makes this t-test easier than a typical t-test, more powerful than a typical t-test. That's why the only reason you can do it is if you're ANOVA significant. Now, after I just told you all about this t-test, chances are we're not going to actually calculate the t-test. What we're going to do is calculate a simplified version of Fisher's protected t called Fisher's LSD. And what does LSD stand for? Yes. It stands for, wow, you guys are tired. At least a little chuckle I was expecting. <laughs> LSD stands for? the least significant difference. The least significant difference. <laughs> OK. The least significant difference. And what it's going to be is, it's going to be a value that we calculate. And then what we're going to do is see if the difference between two means is bigger than that value, then they'll be significant. We're going to do all of these with numbers. So if this is not grabbing you at the moment, don't worry about it. The examples will make it very clear. Yeah? OK. If I would go back, if I would go back and I would do a t-test, OK? So there's a formula for a t-test. How do I tell significance with a t-test? I have to get a t-critical value, right? How do I get a t-critical value? I have to get the degrees of freedom. What would the degrees of freedom be if I was doing that? Degrees of freedom within. So the degrees of freedom within would actually be a larger number than if you just took two groups at a time. Think about that for a minute, folks, OK? If I was using degrees of freedom within, that would incorporate all the groups in my study. Whereas if I'm just doing a t-test usually, it would just be the degrees of freedom for those two groups. Which is going to have a larger degrees of freedom? Degrees of freedom within, the one from the whole study. If I have more degrees of freedom, what happens to my critical value? It decreases, right? Means easier to reject, right? Degrees of freedom go up, T critical value goes down. Easier to reject. Okay, is that good? Okay, so. 
like I said, first we're going to talk about these tests, and then we'll do the computations. So bear with me on this. So the first test we'll learn how to compute is Fisher's LSD. And this is just going to be a value that we calculate. We'll get to it. It's not a big deal. Now what I have to talk about in Fisher's that's a little different than what you're used to is the problem with Fisher's. This is the basic problem with Fisher's. And it has to do with what kind of hypothesis you're testing. Okay. Now, if I'm testing um, five drugs against a placebo, what's been our typical null hypothesis for these multiple groups? Mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3 equals mu4 equals mu5 equals mu6, right? That's typically our null hypothesis. Yeah? Okay? Now, what that means is that, in theory, all of those group means are equal to each other, right? That's what we call a complete null hypothesis. There is the possibility that all of these groups are equal to each other. There are no differences. That's a complete null hypothesis. Now, what if of those, I know that these five drugs are different from the placebo, right? I've already tested this. And I know the placebo is different from at least one of those other drugs, OK? Just from previous testing. So even though I might write down that my null hypothesis is that they're all equal, is that really true? If I know that one of them is different from the others? No. That's what we call a partial null hypothesis. I know that one of them is different. If you have a partial null hypothesis, you can't do, you can't use Fisher's LSD or those protected t-tests. Now, why is that? Why can I not use them? Because remember why you're allowed to use Fisher's LSD. What was the big caveat? Under what circumstance are you allowed to use Fisher's LSD or the protected t? Your ANOVA has to be significant. Now, if, I've already, if I already know that that placebo is different from everybody else, what's going to happen to my ANOVA? Of course it's going to be significant. Right? Of course it's going to be significant. So I stack the deck in my favor to get that significant ANOVA. So if I use Fisher's LSD afterwards, it's like, it's like cheating. right? I set it up so my ANOVA would be significant. So you can't use Fisher's LSD if you have a partial null hypothesis. All those words there, that's what it is. You can't use Fisher's LSD if you have a partial null hypothesis. <laughs> Unless you only have three groups. Unless you only have three groups. So that's the case where Fisher's is used, if you have three groups. That's generally when Fisher's is used. You have a significant ANOVA, and you have three groups, use Fisher's. OK, questions? Questions on any of that little concept? OK? All right. So that's Fisher's. Now let's talk about a different one. This one is called Two Keys. <coughs> This is Tukey, John Tukey's HSD. HSD. What does HSD stand for? Honestly significant difference. Right? Fisher's had the LSD, the least significant difference. Tukey came along and said, well, no, mine is the honestly significant difference. You can tell what people did at statistics conferences. The HSD stands for the honestly significant difference. It's going to be similar. It's going to be similar to how we calculate the Fisher's LSD, but with modifications. Now, what are the modifications going to be? Well, the problem with Fisher's is that over three groups, it starts increasing the alpha per experiment. It starts creeping up. Two keys keeps it down. The HSD keeps that alpha for the experiment down keeps it under 0.05. Actually, that's true. I think it always keeps it under 0.05, which is a little too conservative. But all right. Now, the, the difference in two keys is that 
Because we have three or more means, there's going to be larger differences. Let me back up for a minute. When we calculate, we get a, a t distribution. right? When we have a t distribution, that's based on taking the differences between two means. If I have three or more means, then the difference between the smallest and the largest is going to be bigger than when I just take two means. There's more variability when I have more means. So what that necessitates is a new distribution. So I'm not going to be able to use a t-distribution for this. I'm going to have to use a different one. The different distribution I'm going to use to fix that problem is called the studentized range distribution, or the studentized range statistic. It's a different table. It's noted with the small letter Q. It's going to be noted with a small letter Q. So we have to find, we're going to wind up finding Q critical values because we need a different distribution to deal with three or more means than just a T distribution. It's safer. All right? So that's what that's saying. The more samples drawn, the larger the difference between the smallest and the largest means. Okay. So we're going to need a critical value that accounts for that difference. That's what the studentized range statistic is, Q. Okay? If I set it up like a quote unquote t test, it would be in this form. Nobody uses this form. They use the HSD form, just like the LSD form. But you'll notice there's a Q critical value in here. So again, the structure of that test is very similar, and the way we do it is going to be very similar. But you're going to need to look up on a Q table rather than a T table. All right? Now, the advantage of using two keys is that it does. It keeps that alpha per experiment, or the experiment-wise alpha, keeps it down. Keeps it down. You never have to worry. If you have four groups, five groups, 20 groups, you don't have to worry. It always keeps that alpha per experiment down. So you're not increasing your type 1 error rate. That's a good thing. And you don't have to worry about the partial or the complete null, none of that. What's the problem with Tukey? It's very conservative. Very conservative. That means there's less power. And we know what it means when we say there's less power, right? Less power means less of a chance of finding a significant difference between two groups. That's what we mean by less power. So even though two keys is really safe, in some ways it's a little too safe. So it can be problematic. So this is always the problem between any test you look at. And by the way, uh, Fisher's, uh, two keys, these are post hoc tests or post hoc tests. These are tests after the fact, after you've looked at the means. They're post hoc tests. Okay? The trade off in terms of deciding which test you use is always going to be between keeping your alpha experiment wise down and keeping your power high. So the LSD, right, has extra power for more than three groups, but it lets the alpha per experiment get bigger. Not such a good idea. Um, HSD is generally for more than three groups. So within this class, generally, if it's three groups, do an LSD if you have a significant ANOVA. If it's more than three groups, you're going to be doing an HSD. OK? Um, HSD does not require a significant omnibus F. What do we mean by an omnibus F? The overall F for the ANOVA for the whole experiment, right? Fishers, you have to do a whole ANOVA. If it's significant, you can follow it up with t-test. Two keys, not only does the ANOVA not have to be significant, you don't even have to do an ANOVA. You can just go right into doing two keys HST. You can do that. Okay? Um, accuracy for two keys depends on equal ends. For Fishers, not is such a big deal. Two keys, equal ends. If you don't have equal ends, but there's small differences, you can use the harmonic mean of the ends. All right, I'm going to talk really briefly about some other possible tests you could use. You're not going to learn how to compute these. I just want you to have an idea that they're out there. 
Like if you look in SPSS, you go to ANOVA, and then it asks you what post hoc tests you want to do. There's like, I don't know, 15 there or something. There's so many there. We're only looking at a couple. And I'm only going to tell you how to compute a couple. Uh, the newman cools test, or the student newman cools test. All right. Um, so this is nice because it's somewhere between an HSD and an LSD. A little less conservative than the HSD, a little safer than the LSD, right? Uh, we used to have trouble doing it because you needed computers to figure out certain things. And I know they've been around in your lifetime, but like even not so long ago for me, it was harder to do these things. Um, and the problem is it also starts to let alpha creep up. So even though it's a possibility, it also has issues. And again, one of these things that you should know is if you're doing a study, right? you've decided you're doing some research, you're working with somebody, you do a study, and then you're following it up. You just have to be able to justify what tests you're doing. Because people will come back to you and say, why did you do multiple t-tests? You know? uh, why didn't you do an ANOVA? And, you, you know, and you'll have to go back and do an ANOVA. And then they'll come back to you and say, well, why did you use fissures? There's more than five groups here. That's not a good thing. So you have to be able to justify each step along the way which ones you're using. There's a test called Dunnett's test. And, it's a very, and Dunnett's test is only used in very specific situations, like you have one control or one placebo and a bunch of other, let's say, drug conditions. So it's a very, very specific test that you you wouldn't be doing too often, but it's a powerful test. The other test that's pretty widely used is the REGWQ test. REG and W stand for the first initials of the people who developed the test. But it's a Q test, right? It uses Q, the, um, that studentized range statistic that I mentioned before. Now, it's a nice modification of Tukey's, because what it does is, is it calculates a Q critical value for each comparison. When we do Tukey's, you'll see, Tukey's, you do a one-shot deal. You get a Q critical value for, the whole, for as many comparisons as you're making, whereas the REGWQ does it individually for each comparison you're setting up. That's nice. And again, I'm not going to show you how to compute this, but you should know it's an SPSS. It's an easy thing to do. Now, another test that I don't see used so often yet, but I think will be, is something called the modified LSD. The modified LSD. And the modified LSD is essentially a cross between an HSD and an LSD. You still need a significant ANOVA. And then you still compute an HSD, but you modify the parameters. Like when we do the HSD, what am I going to have to look up? A Q critical value. A Q critical value. The Q critical value, the way I'm going to look it up is, again, is I'm going to need like the number of groups, and I'm not going to need degrees of freedom. The modified LSD, you do a similar thing, but we change how we look up the Q critical value. That's the big difference there. But it's real simple, and it's, you know, it should be used much, um, much more frequently. Nearly as powerful as the REGWQ, but it's still conservative, and it's really easy to explain and calculate, for that matter. So that might be a really good way to go if you want something more powerful than the HSD, but more conservative than the LSD. OK? Anybody have any questions on that? Those are all, by the way, those are all post hoc tests. OK, now I think we're going to be doing examples. OK, <coughs> does diet affect bicycle riding speed? The dependent variable is time in minutes to ride six miles. And even though we have the ANOVAs figured out there, I think we're going to go through the ANOVA count computations just as a quick reminder. Yeah, we're, yeah. OK, good. Um, just by the way, in this study, take a look. First of all, take a look at the means. Which group seems to do better? I heard someone say the normal diet. Anyone want to argue with that? 
health food, right? Always look at your numbers, right? Our automatic response is, oh, bigger numbers better, right? No, it's not. In this case, we want lower numbers. That means faster. So yeah, so it seems that the health food diet is the best. Are those significantly different from each other? We don't know, right? They could be. It looks like maybe health food might be different from the other two. The other two don't necessarily look so different from each other. You know, also one thing to keep in mind is we're talking about minutes. One minute, two minutes, does anybody care? Well, if you're an Olympic rider, yeah, right? A minute is eternity. So and sometimes this has more importance than other times. Actually, an interesting thing is, so look at those categories. If you were actually designing a study, do you see any problem with those categories as they are? Any issues that might arise with those three categories? Or do they seem just fine to you? Yeah. <clears throat> what is a normal diet? Yes. That would be, that would be my guess, right? Because I could guarantee you what is considered normal for me is not what's normal for you. I am pretty, pretty sure of that. Um, but even at that, right, like, you have to take into account what other things are going on. I was just reading an article this morning that's talking about one of the big issues that we're dealing with these days is you guys are being inundated with an amount of media information on what you should eat. OK? Think about this. 100 years ago, no one was writing articles telling you, you should eat this, you shouldn't eat that. You know, your mothers, your grandmothers said, eat this, you know? And if you were lucky, you had enough of it, and you could eat. Right? Nowadays, it's do I eat low fat, which fats, saturated, non-saturated, uh, whole grains, not whole grains, dairy, no dairy. You know, like it's, it's an, and you sit there thinking, OK, just give me my potato chips and leave me alone. You know? Because right? it, it gets to be a little overwhelming. And one of the problems is how do we test in people um, what foods do to you? You know, because that's the other thing. You know, if you eat, Broccoli, everybody's like, oh, okay, broccoli's good for you. But then, as scientists, we try to isolate what in broccoli is good for you. And then people say, ah, we found this is the thing in broccoli that's good for you. Take a pill for it. It's very hard to isolate nutrients in a varied human diet to figure out what is the thing that works and what doesn't work. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So when you know we do stuff like this, these are like nice, beautiful, little, pristine examples that I bring in so you have some idea of what goes into computation of numbers, but they don't represent what a good study would be. OK, sorry, that's the soapbox for today. But <coughs> let's, do, let's do these computations, OK? Now, I gave you all the information. So the truth is, you could do any of those formulas. You could do any of those formulas. I think, I think let's do the mean square formulas. Let's do the mean square formulas for equal ends, just because. And then we'll work backwards, OK? So and that's within. And again, if I have equal ends, my ms within is just the average of the variances. That's it. Try to, try to like, remember these kind of simple things. It'll help you keep a grasp on all of this computation. MS within is just the average of the variances if your sample sizes are equal. I mean, if they're unequal, all it is is a weighted average. That's all it is, too. OK, so I have. What information do I have here? Standard deviations. So we have to remember to square them. What's k in this example? Yeah, 3. That's my mean square within. 
my mean square between Okay, big question. What's n? You have five, right? Sorry, I'm like making this. I didn't do this whole out myself on this with this formula, so. Anybody not know where some of the numbers are coming from? Seems reasonably clear. OK, because I want to go back to this table now, because we can fill in the whole table. You get those two mean squares, and you can fill in the whole table. Eh? So right, those are our mean squares. My degrees of freedom. Well, we know it's k minus 1 for between. So that's 3 minus 1 is 2. What about for within? It's nt minus k. What is nt? The total number of observations. So what is that here? 15, yeah, minus 3, that's 12. And then our degrees of freedom total, well, one way we know is they add up, so it's 14, or nt minus 1. So those are ways to check. Okay. How do I get the sum of squares? I have the mean squares, I have degrees of freedom. How do I get my sum of squares? Multiply, right? When I go in that direction, I multiply. And I get SS total by adding up SS between and SS within. And then what's my F ratio? How do I get my F ratio? Yeah, MS between divided by MS within. All right, so we have to know, is it significant or not? I have to look up an F critical value. What degrees of freedom for that F critical value? Yeah, 2 and 12. Right, 2 for the numerator, 12 for the denominator. So what is my conclusion here? Significant or not? Yes, right? There is a significant difference in the amount of minutes to ride six miles depending on which group you belong to. Problem is, we don't know which groups are different. OK? Yeah? The F calculated this. Okay, so which post hoc tests am I justified in doing? Yeah, well, that's we're going to do both, but you're justified in doing an LSD because our ANOVA is significant and we only have three groups. So let's do that. So the LSD is real simple. We're not going to calculate the protected t-tests. They're there. If you want to work them out, you can work them out. I'm just going to show you computationally how to do the LSD, because that's what I expect you to do. If you did it the other way, it would be fine. OK, so what do we need here? Well, where do I get MS within from? The table, right? The ANOVA table we just did. N is going to be what? <coughs> Five, right? We just figured that. The only thing I'm missing is that t-critical value. 
How do I get the t critical value? I have to look it up on a table, right? What degrees of freedom do I need for it? To look that up. That's the question. And that's the question you asked me before. It's degrees of freedom within, right? Because it's going to match up to this. So 12. So the t-critical value you find with 12 degrees of freedom, OK? You have to remember that. That's something. Make sure you write that down when you're writing your notes. The critical value is based on degrees of freedom within. So in this example, our t-critical value is 2.179. I'm not going to look it up because you guys can do that at this point. What that's saying is, my least significant difference is 1.65 minutes. Minutes. So now what I have to do is I have to compute the differences between each pair of means and see whether it's bigger than that or not. Okay? So let's do the first one. Normal versus Health food. Even at that, what's health food? What do we mean by health food? I don't know. And what is that? 3.2 minutes. So is my 3.2 minutes bigger than my 1.65? Yeah, so they're significantly different. Right? The 1.65 is my least significant difference. All right, normal and vitamin. Let's see. There's only one minute difference between those two. So are they significantly different from each other? Nope. And then vitamin versus health food. Significant? Yes. So if you were going to summarize this, what would you say? If you just wanted to, you know, you were just telling somebody, you read this story, and you just wanted to summarize in words briefly, what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, OK, that's good. Is there some way you could say it that would be more concise? Yeah. Well, it seems that the health food diet is different from the other two. And the other two don't seem to be different from each other. Right? Just try to like summarize it in your head when you get these differences. All right? Question on any of that, any of those computations or where anything came from? You see, it's pretty simple, right? So this is what you have to do from now on in, right? You have an ANOVA. If it's not significant, you're done. If it is significant, you follow it up with something like a Fisher's LSD. Yeah. APA, I don't think that there's like, I don't know on that template if I actually put a whole APA thing. Essentially, it would be saying that there's a significant difference, and you might report the p-value. OK. So that is Fisher's. Next, Tukey. And Tukey is going to be very simple because it's very similar. Here's Tukey's. 
The only thing that's going to be different is looking up this Q critical value. Right? Because we still have the MS within is still from the table. The N hasn't changed. It's only going to be the Q critical value. So let's take a look at this table. Okay? This is a Q table, so day 11. It's like after the F tables. I think it's after. I don't think it's before. Yeah, it's after. Notice what we have. Down the side here is degrees of freedom for the error term. What do we mean by error term? MS within, in a generic way, it's the denominator of your F. It's not always going to be MS within. So it's the denominator of your F. And across the top, number of groups or number of steps between ordered means. Now, the number of steps between ordered means, that refers to the REGWQ and the Newman Coles test, where what they do is instead is they put the means in order and then find how many means are different. Like if you have three means, there's a difference of two between the first and the third. We're not going to concern ourselves with that. What we're really concerned about is because we're not going to do those computations, is the HSD. So we need the number of groups. So for the HSD, in order to find your Q critical value, you need the number of groups and the degrees of freedom within. Number of groups and degrees of freedom within. So in this example, what do we have? Number of groups. How many groups? Three. Degrees of freedom within are what? Twelve. So our T critical value, our Q critical value, sorry, our Q critical value is 3.77. So again, remember, it's number of groups and degrees of freedom within. How does it compare to the LSD? It's bigger, right? It's more conservative, harder to reject. <coughs> HSD makes it tougher on you. So then how would you use the HSD? The same way we just did the LSD. You get the difference between the means and compare them to your HSD. So let's look again, right? Is that significantly different? Yeah. That one? No. That one? Yeah, just. Right? It's close. So our results were actually the same. That does not always happen. Sometimes you'll get significant differences with the LSD that you don't with the HSD. Because you can see this is much bigger. OK? Questions on that? So now you know how to do two post-hope tests. Um, I'm not sure if you have these next couple of slides. They're not big deals. It was more for me than for you. But just to remind me if there's anything big to talk about. If you don't have it, don't worry about it. Um, it's just comparison between LSD and HSD. If the ANOVA is not significant, it's unusual to find a difference using the HSD. Not unusual with the LSD. Okay. Um, yeah, LSD more than three groups, not recommended. H yeah, we said this already. These are the basic assumptions. You've seen these assumptions about 100 times at this point. Independent random sampling, normal distributions, homogeneity variance, you know this stuff. So this one, additional assumptions, all right? And again, this is all stuff I talked about. It's just kind of consolidated here. You need a significant overall ANOVA. Equal ends are not required, but it makes it easier for calculations. Um, and usually just use it for three groups. 
Suki's HSD, equal ends are assumed. Use harmonic mean of the ends if you don't have, if there's small differences. Now, this is something, let me just stress this. It assumes that all possible pairwise comparisons are being performed or were chosen after seeing the data. This is post hoc. It's assuming that you're looking at all possible comparisons. If you weren't, there are other options. But if you're looking at all of them, it's, that's what this one is assuming. Okay. And yeah, I know I skipped the Bonferroni because I just put it in a different place that made me happier. But we will get back to it. Okay. Any questions on, on that stuff? That should be pretty clear. Yeah? No? No? It's stuff to get out of the book. It was just, you know, things that I had from a previous edition that I liked that I kept. But I didn't think it was necessary for you guys, you know. Especially, I think, he had taken it out of the book in that particular order. So I thought, okay, why bother you guys with it? But it makes it easier for me. Okay? So those are your basic tests. Now, these confidence intervals. I just want to talk about this for a minute, these confidence intervals. The LSD and the, the modified and the ordinary LSD are what we call um, examples of sequential comparisons. Sequential. That means, what does sequential mean? One thing after another. You do the ANOVA, then you do a post hoc test. That's sequential. Okay? The HSD is considered a simultaneous comparison because you don't need a, a significant ANOVA. You don't even have to do an ANOVA. Okay? So you can also create confidence intervals using the HSD. And I'm going to show you briefly how to do that because it's useful. It is useful. All right, look at this formula. This formula is what we've always talked about, right? A confidence interval. A point estimate plus or minus a critical value times some kind of standard error type thing. What this is, you know what this whole value is? Does it look familiar? Know what it is? It's the HST. So you could create a confidence interval just by adding and subtracting the HSD from the differences between your means. So let's actually do one. I can show you. It's very simple. We'll do it for the normal versus health food. Plus or minus was my HSD. That whole little part just consolidates into my HSD. So if I was going to put this in words, I would say, right, I'm 95% confident that 1.18 to 5.22 minutes contains the population mean difference in the number of minutes it takes to ride six miles between a normal and a health food diet. And I'm going to ask you to write um, confidence intervals, so don't get, you know, don't get crazed by that. But that's how you would do it. How would you use it to find significance? What, I, what would I look at here to find significance using this confidence interval? Yeah. What do you mean by the minimum required difference? No, but I'm wondering what you mean by that. That's OK. When we use a confidence interval, what do we always look to see whether it's in the confidence interval? What, what am I looking at? The hypothesized value. OK? And I, I stress the hypothesized value because if you're doing it for one mean, it's different than if you're doing it for two groups. Right? For one group, for one mean, could be a particular value. But what was typically our hypothesized value for two groups? Zero. Zero. So the same thing here. I look for zero within the interval. And of course, zero is not there, so we say that these groups are significantly different from each other. 
right? Which is good because that's what those are the results we got. But that's basically your idea. Okay? Those are your confidence intervals. Now, here is the the, the a priori test I'm going to show you. This was supposed to be earlier, but I like it better here. Those were post hoc tests. Now I'm going to show you an a priori test before the fact. Right? This is a test you would decide on before you even, often before you even collect your data, because it's based on theory <coughs> or previous results or something like that. Now remember what I said, right? This whole class has been, how do I keep alpha for the experiment from getting big? Hmm? And we adjusted it, but we adjusted it by using, we did the t-test, but we made sure the ANOVA was significant. We used Q, right? But what if I just adjusted the alpha directly? So, right? so my alpha for the entire experiment is, let's say, 0.05. Okay? And if I have, let's say, within a study, I have several groups, but there are only four things I want to test. You got that? Very often we do studies where we might have multiple tests going on. There might be only four things I'm interested in testing. Sometimes there's just extra tests there that I'm not particularly interested in, comparing to control groups or some other stuff. I'm not interested in it. So let's say I have four things I'm interested in. Why could I not instead do it this way? Take my alpha of 0.05 and divide it by 4. If I do that, I'm left with an alpha of 0.0125 for each comparison I do, for each test I'm interested in doing. Right? That makes sense, doesn't it? So now I could just do a t-test. But the alpha for each of those t-tests is only 0.0125. If I do that, I'll never exceed 0.05 for the entire experiment. That makes sense, right? That's called the Bonferroni alpha, or the Bonferroni test, or the Bonferroni done test, or the done test. People usually refer to it as the Bonferroni. What it is, is you're adjusting alpha directly. You're dividing it up by the number of tests you have to do so that it doesn't get too big. So that's exactly what this is saying. Take my alpha for the experiment, divide by j is the number of comparisons you're doing. It's not the number of groups. It's not the number of possible tests. It's only the number of tests you're doing. If you divide that, then you're given alpha per comparison. Now the only problem with that, years ago anyway, is who had a table for alpha 0.0125, or any other fractional number we could have. Nobody had tables, so how do you use it? Well, that's why Dunn came along and he developed the tables. Now, we don't even look up the tables. We just do it in computers and they calculate it exactly. So as Bonferronis are in SPSS, it calculates it exactly. So it's a way of keeping that alpha down. Now, it's a priori because this is the problem with a Bonferroni. It is super conservative. Can you imagine if you had 10 tests you were doing, how small your alpha would have to be for each of those tests? It's super conservative. So the best way to use a Bonferroni is before you've looked at your data, you decide on a subset of the things you want to test. So then you're only dividing by a smaller number. And then it's useful. And then it's useful. Notice something? It's only legitimate to eliminate tests from consideration before you see the data. If you're looking at it, that's not fair. OK? Um, what else do I want to say about that? Right. So then you would just do regular t-test. You just do your regular good old t-test and compare it to that You know, to get the alpha. It'll be fine. Okay. Questions on that? Questions on the Bonferroni? Right? It's a simple way of doing it. And then lastly, just mention the modified LSD, okay? 
So I mentioned it before, but now it should be really clear what it is. So for modified LSD, you find out if your ANOVA is significant. And then you calculate an HSD. What was the different thing about an HSD? We had to find a Q critical value, right? What, how did I find the Q critical value on the table? What did I need to find the Q critical value? Number of groups and degrees of freedom within. So what's the only thing here? Instead of using the number of groups, you use the number of groups minus 1. That's the only difference. It's the only difference. But what that will do is it'll make the HSD somewhat smaller. Somewhat smaller. So it's more powerful than the HSD, but more conservative than the regular LSD. Okay? So this is kind of um, brief what we'll talk like to wrap up some of what we did and what we're going to talk about. Which comparisons do you use? Three groups, significant ANOVA, use the LSD. More than three groups, HSD, REGWQ, modified LSD, or the Fisher Hader test. I don't know what people call it. If you had different ends and you had more than three groups, you couldn't use two keys if your ends were very different. So you would use something called the Games Howell test. That adjusts for it. If they're complex, that's what we're going to talk about Wednesday. Okay, we'll do complex comparisons on Wednesday. All right, we're done. <laughs>